What's up fellow travelers? So today's a pretty big day for me because I'm finally setting off on a trip to Singapore that's been in the works since last year. Uh, I started my day in Toronto this morning and I'm about to set off for the second and longest leg of the journey from San Francisco to Changi Airport. Less fun is the fact that I'm going to be suffering through the 16 hour flight in the United Economy. Still not sure if I'm going to be alive when I come out the other end, so stay tuned for that. When I got into the cabin, all of the windows were set to dim. This kept the cabin pretty cool, but it also made it feel pretty small. I was already dreading 16 hours in this point. There was a pillow and blanket at the seat, and the crew came around just before we pushed back to pass around headphones. Now, as for the seat, I was sitting in a standard in the United Economy, which is to say no extra legroom at all. The legroom was alright, but still a pretty typical slimline wide body seat, not unlike what you'd find on Air Canada or American, so definitely pretty narrow. I'm not a small guy by any stretch, but this was still quite a squeeze considering the lengths of flights these planes are flying. That being said, the seat was pretty firm and comfortable enough. I had no complaints about the in-flight entertainment system either, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. We pushed back more or less right on time and started the long taxi out to 2 8 left. Our flight was scheduled to depart at 11.35 and just under 20 minutes after that we were rolling onto the runway and it was time to go. It's pretty wild how long it takes a 787 to get airborne when you've got 16 hours of fuel on board.
first meal service wasn't until about an hour after takeoff, so I had some time to play around with the in-flight entertainment system. It was a pretty typical setup for economy, but it was responsive and had a decent selection. I really liked the moving map, which, even though it was only 2D, United had customized to include a few extra pieces of nerd-level information. I will say the movie selection page was laid out in the best way, and it took quite a bit of scrolling through alphabetical order titles to find what I was looking for, but otherwise no issues. My only other gripe with the system was the screen itself. It bothers me when screens in economy are fixed and you can't adjust them, because when the person in front of you reclines, you suddenly have to watch everything at a weird angle. It's small, but it would have been nice to have an adjustable screen. About an hour after takeoff, the crew came through with the first meal service. This started with a drink cart, serving some juices, coffee, tea, beer, and wine. Spirits and all the other alcoholic drinks were an additional charge. The meal choice was between chicken and pasta, and I opted for the chicken. Contrary to how it looked, the chicken was actually pretty flavorful and tasted relatively good, but it was still a very basic meal. The salad was literally just a piece of cucumber and tomato and lettuce. I would have liked to see a lot more than this. That being said, ice cream was served with another drink after dessert, and the ice cream was out of this world. After lunch, the windows were dimmed and locked on minimum brightness so people could sleep. I'm a little torn on crew doing this. I will say it definitely helped me get some sleep, and it sucks when people have those windows open full wide or full brightness on the 787. But it's rough spending literally 13 hours in complete darkness. That being said, the one upside with it being a Dreamliner is that even though the windows are blacked out, you can still see through them, so I did a fair bit of dark cloud gazing during the flight. Now, I decided to bite the bullet and try out the Wi-Fi on this flight, which was definitely nothing to write home about. Service over the Pacific was, as you might expect, pretty slow, though to their credit I had a connection almost the entire way across, even if I could only use this for very slow messaging. Considering the value for this kind of thing on foreign airlines, the $18 I paid for an hour of this was definitely pretty steep. Uh, the other Wi-Fi options on the flight were $25 for two hours or $40 for the whole flight. So about an hour before we landed, the crew came around with a second meal service along with some drinks, uh, and it was the exact same meal choice again this time between pasta or chicken, which I thought was a little bit odd. Uh, this time I opted for the pasta, which is a spinach manicotti, and it was pretty good, but really nothing too special again. Now, just as we start getting set up for landing, I wanted to share with you some of my personal favorite tips and tricks for surviving long-haul flights like these. I've done a few similar trips, and I've found there are a few things that are really important to keep in mind when you're setting off on an ultra-long haul, especially when you're going to be in economy. So first, don't just sit there and count the hours. It's so easy to wait in your seat thinking about how much longer it's going to be before you land, but that's going to turn a 15-hour trip into a 40-hour one. Make sure you've brought enough things with you that are going to keep you entertained that you can switch between so you're never bored. For me, that's things like podcasts, downloaded Netflix, and music, along with planning on sleeping and watching movies on the in-flight entertainment system. In any case, self-care is so important here. Make sure you know the things that are going to keep you entertained, happy, and relaxed, and plan accordingly. Now, my second tip is a pretty common one, but make sure you get out and stretch. Even if it's just standing up for a minute or so at your seat, it's going to get the blood flowing, and especially if you get the chance to go for a walk through the cabin, I find it really helps to break up the flight and give you a little boost of energy to keep you refreshed. My final tip is maybe the most important one, and it's that you need to get yourself set up for the long haul trip at the start of the flight. Your seat is going to be your home for almost a day, so make sure you only have what you need and what you don't stays in your bag tucked away in the overhead bin or under the seat in front of you. Plug in your phone charger, or at least have it handy, and take out any books, snacks, or electronics you're going to want to use during the flight, along with the pen if you need to fill out any customs forms. Having things like this easily accessible is going to make you feel like you have a lot more space and limits the amount of awkward searching around you're going to be doing during the flight.
Your seat is your space for quite some time, so just make sure it's organized. It's so important. Now, just to share some final thoughts for this trip, as you might expect, any kind of long haul in a U.S. economy seat is rough. There's no getting around that unless you have the money to buy yourself some extra legroom. It would be nice to see a little bit more space become the standard for ultra long haul seats, though, because 17 inches of pitch really doesn't cut it. I will say, though, once I got settled in, the flight went by a lot quicker than I thought it would. The crew were super friendly and came around pretty regularly, and although the meals were pretty sparse, they were still edible. The Wi-Fi at $40 for the flight was super overpriced, but a solid in-flight entertainment system made up for a lot of that. I also couldn't really complain because I booked the entire trip from Toronto to Singapore to Vancouver for under 800 Canadian. That was thanks to ITA Matrix and some help from my friend Andrew over at RTW Travel. Uh, it took a lot of searching to find that, but when you're paying less than $400 one way for a trip crossing 12 time zones, I'd pretty much take any seat. Flying flights this long really can be rough and, and a little disorienting in the back, but with 20 to 22 hour flights on the horizon, they're becoming more and more the norm. 
At the time I posted this, this was the 12th longest flight in the world, and I wouldn't be surprised if that ranking dropped in the next couple of years. Luckily, more and more research is being done into long-haul flying, and you can really feel the difference in humidity and comfort on planes like the Dreamliner, even when you're crammed in the back. As long as you take care of yourself, stretch when you can, and set yourself up well for a good flight, you can land feeling refreshed, comfortable, and ready to see the world. I'm working on a video tour of the Shanghai Airport and an a and review next, so stay tuned for those. They should be out in the next couple weeks. And in any case, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to you guys who took the time to watch this video. Your support really means a lot to me. Take care, everyone.